Hello once again AP Calculus students, Mr. Record here from Avon High School and we're going to take a look at our remaining two examples uh, from our topic 1.5, determining limits using algebraic properties or sometimes I like to call these those really tricky limit questions. We've already done a, a series of videos over example one that dealt with sums and differences and products and now with our example two uh, in our previous video part A we did a composite function uh, for our uh, first foyer into this and we're going to take a look at the remaining two examples from that particular example too. Now remember everything hinges upon this rule for limits of composite functions above and it basically says if you have a limit of the outer function that you know exists or the inner function let's say g of x and if the outer function f of x is continuous then you are allowed to essentially resolve your limit by pushing this limit idea inside and letting it take hold of your inner function g and then evaluate it at the outer function. The problem with that is that one of two bad things that can happen. Bad thing number one, it could be the fact that the inner function's limit does not exist, or bad thing number two, it could be that the outer function is not continuous at the value of the inner function's limit. And that's what we've been seeing uh, recently in our examples, and we will likely continue to see as we look at examples B and C. So let's take a look here at the limit of f of g of x as x approaches 3. Now again, you're given a pair of graphs, and we're going to go ahead and work on the assumption that this limit of x of 3 can be pushed inside, let it take hold of the inner function, that would be g of x in this case. And of course, we would still have the outer function f of part of the uh, process here. So when we take a look at the limit of g of x as x approaches 3, it's very clear that the answer is 0. But when we go to our function f and we see what's going on at 0, it's like, well, what are we saying here? And it's very common for students just to assume that because the inner function does exist and you get 0, that the answer is just going to be the outer function evaluated at zero, which in this case would be three. I would think that that would be a very good choice to put on a multiple choice type of question because it's wrong. And we're going to take a very good look at to why it is wrong here in a little bit. So we don't want to think of it like that. What we want to do instead is think about how is it that we are approaching this value of zero. And, and we know that we can do so in one of two ways. So if we were to think of this from the standpoint that the limit of g of x as x approaches 3, well, if we approach 3 from the left, uh, we get 0 from the left. So I guess we, we have the option that we could get 0 from the left, or we have the option where this would approach 0 from the right side. Now notice I'm, I'm kind of interchanging the idea of left and right from above and below. When I was approaching this zero from below, that manifests itself to being approaching the zero from the left side. Likewise, when I was approaching the zero from above, that means that I'm approaching it from values uh, of zero approaching values of 0 that are larger than 0, so 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, etc. And then because I've got the two different ways that we approach 0, that essentially means that I can find the outer function's limit using both of those processes. So I'm going to find the limit of f of x as x approaches 0 from the left, and in this case, when I go back to my f graph, approaching 0 from the left looks like it's going to give me a positive 1, and it is. And if I approach positive uh, 0, let's say 0 from the positive side, from the right side, I'm going to land on a limit of positive 2. Now, because those two entities are not equivalent to each other, we're going to be able to say that the limit of x approaching 3 of f of g of x does not exist, and we can abbreviate that DNE. 
Now I always like to show my students that visual reinforcement and I'm going to go ahead and rely on my good old TI Inspire like I did before. And if you recall, if you haven't seen the other two videos, I've gone ahead and sketched a graph of our f of x function here using a, a six piece piecewise function. And here's our g of x, which is a, I believe a four piece piecewise function. Now in my uh, 1.3 page here, I'm just simply going to enter a new function defined in our part B, which was f of g of x. Now f is called f1 on my calculator and g is called f2. And so that would essentially graph f of g of x and there it is. And then if you recall in our original problem, we were going to be approaching three. And lo and behold, notice what happens as X approaches three from the left, as X approaches three from the right, we do get two different values and those values um, are going to lead us to say a does not exist for our overall limit. Let's return and finish up our example B now. So for our example, uh, I'm sorry, example C rather. For our example C, I'm gonna to have to do a little scrolling up and forth here, so forgive me for that. But we're gonna go ahead and take on the initial idea that we can just push that limit inside of our, our outer function. And so we've got the limit of f of x as x approaches uh, seven, and we're gonna composite that inside of an outer function g. Okay, well, let's go up to our graph and see what's going on here. Let's clean both of these guys up a little bit. And so as x approaches 7, for our f of x, I notice that, oh darn, it looks like I'm going to have, well, either positive infinity or positive infinity. I, I would probably venture to say that that limit is approaching positive infinity. And it really doesn't matter how we approach positive infinity because you're doing so the same way on both sides. There's only one way to approach positive infinity and that's from below, from numbers that are less than this concept of infinity. And so you can't really evaluate g of infinity, although you could try. Rather, what you're going to think of is taking this infinity idea and letting x approach it as you evaluate the outer function. Now we run over to our g of x function, we let x go to infinity. Hopefully you can see, or, or at least interpret from this graph, is that this horizontal dashed line is supposed to serve as a horizontal asymptote, which means the curve is getting closer and closer and closer to that y value of two as x grows unbounded. And so this limit, would certainly give us an answer of two, which just basically means overall, our limit of g of f is going to be positive two. Once again, let's take a look at this from a graphical perspective. I'm gonna have to go in here and change things up a little bit. I'm gonna have to delete our original function there. And then I'm gonna go pop, pop back in. And now I'm gonna put my g function on the outside. Remember that was going to be f2 of x, the f function on the inside, f1 hit enter. Remember, x was approaching 7, so I better kind of move my camera out of the way. Boy, there's a lot going on over here at 7, isn't there? It's some crazy stuff. But lo and behold, if x approaches 7 from both sides, what do you think that y value is becoming? And sure enough, it is 2. So we have the wonderful graphical evidence that supports our finding. Anyway, I hope this has helped out uh, uh, with your experience with some of these tricky limits, they're not very commonly going to be encountered on the AP exam. Typically, if they show up, it would be maybe one multiple choice question, but I always love to teach them to my kids because it really reinforces A, the properties, and B, the powerful, wonderful usefulness of using the one-sided approach. Anyhow, does it for this video. Study your calculus, and we'll see you next time.